it's not the basic building blocks of proteins. You don't have new proteins. You don't have a new brain protein that will basically suddenly make you smarter. No, you just have the same building blocks rearranged and controlled and expressed slightly differently. And that's sort of the beauty of evolution. The fact that, yes, sometimes there's dramatic events like the whole gene duplication, where, which allows you to have now 10,000 new genes that you can do anything you want with. And you know you can specialize these genes. You can create new domains. You can sort of every now and then you can create new genes out of nowhere. Most of the time you get new genes by duplication, which allows you to sort of start tinkering with something that's already functional. Hi everyone, welcome to Reason with Science. I'm your host Chitendo. This is a conversation with Manolis Kellis. He is a professor at MIT and head of the MIT Computational Biology Group. Here we talk about Manolis's journey to become an MIT professor, life as an information, elements of genomes, human genome project, and current progress in understanding of human genomes. Enjoy the conversation, share and subscribe to support the podcast. Thank you for listening. Hi, Manolis. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Jitender. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so let's start with your journey to become an M MIT professor. How did so it start? I was, I was very lucky. I was at the right place at the right time. So uh, I basically have always been fascinated with biology. I've always loved biology and the natural world. I, it's hard not to be in awe of the world around us. And uh, I hope I'm uh, conveying this to my kids as well, who are basically constantly studying nature and studying life. And they both want to be scientists, uh, like the, the two older ones. And uh, they all want to study animals, interestingly. So they, you know, they don't care so much about the human body. I hope that will eventually happen. Uh, they're interested in the human body and the human brain. But uh, my, my own interests like, started out very similar to them, basically, the diversity of life. I grew up by the countryside in Greece. Uh, you know, we had a home in Athens, but most of my memories are from the home in uh, our summer house, basically on the Aegean uh, seafront. And we had a large garden. I would always just play in the garden and run around and sort of, you know, just observe animals and plants. And I had a mask, so I would always dive and uh, go on these long snorkel uh, trips and always observe the incredible diversity of life. So I've always been fascinated with life itself. And uh, when I was an undergrad, I basically studied computer science and mathematics and sort of the more quantitative sciences is what drew me for most of my life. And then uh, I did my undergrad in computer science at MIT and I started studying artificial intelligence and sort of uh, how do we create intelligence. And uh, then <clears throat> I was actually taking Marvin Minsky's class on the society of mind. Uh, and uh, I had to write a final paper for that class. And I debated between sort of evolution of language and sort of human thought and how that has shaped language and evolution of life. And in the end, I basically decided to write about evolution of life. And uh, sort of the, the problem that puzzled me was how, how you get complexity, like this exponential increase in complexity that we see, that you basically took, you know, a billion years or two billion years to sort of get to uh, life, to like, you know, the simplest life forms like bacteria, and then, you know, enormous amounts of time to get to the first multicellular life. And then, you know, sort of things kind of sped up. Basically, if you look at how little time has elapsed between this incredible you know emergence of complexity so my very theoretical paper was about the fact that there need to be there needed to be another form of information encoded in genomes which would be about evolvability that basically maybe what we got in the first billion years or so was to get better at evolving and sort of that has to do with modularity that has to do with some kind of reversibility where you can sort of go back and forth between different environmental traits where you sort of maintain diversity where um you know if you look at sexual reproduction for example the emergence of sexual reproduction is a major major step 
But what it allows you to do is now have this ability to sort of have allelic you know, diversity and by being deployed to sort of have recessive traits that can then you know, sort of maintain some form of memory, if you wish, of ancestral alleles that can be beneficial as the environment is shifting back and forth. So anyway, my, my paper was you know, very theoretical about sort of evolvability and, and sort of that as a necessity for genetic algorithms to eventually be able to achieve complexity levels in the billions of nucleotides that the human genome has. And uh, to write this paper, I basically started uh, reading a lot of genetics uh, books, uh, books on, you know, sort of molecular biology and cellular biology and sort of trying to understand what would be the instantiation of these constructs. And that basically got me hooked into sort of learning more about biology. And that was the time also that I was basically finishing up my undergrad and master's and I was getting ready to embark on a PhD. And even though my PhD was in computer science, I ended up uh, writing a thesis on genomics. So I, I basically did a thesis on comparative genomics of yeast species. And that's when I first started embracing biology as a quantitative, you know, information-based discipline. Like basically the, the, the way that I had envisioned biology when I was starting my undergraduate was that you had to memorize a gazillion things about sort of, you know, different parts of life. And uh, as a grad student, the way that I discovered it was more that, no, in, instead there's a common unifying principle centered on the genome. And that if you could understand the information in DNA, you would basically have a, a very sort of foundational view of biology and life and biological processes and evolution. So in a way, my PhD project blended my passions for understanding evolution and for uh, quantitative sciences and you know, computer science and uh, information-based understanding of life and just the foundational principles of the rules of life, the rules of biology as a set of foundations upon which you could then start layering in knowledge about gene regulation, about uh, the encoding of the genes themselves and so on and so forth. So that's how I got into this whole discipline. And uh, how I became a professor is totally serendipitous, basically. Um, Pavel Pevsner um, contacted me because his student, Ben Raphael, was visiting MIT and heard me at a seminar uh, present my thesis or present some work that I was doing for my thesis. And Ben emails Pavel saying, hey, this guy's great, you should hire him. Pavel emails me saying, hey, you should interview for UCSD as a professor. And I'm a third year grad student. I'm like, professor? Like, I, you know, I never actually thought of having a career. I, you know, I just loved doing research and I never actually planned anything out. So it's now January 2003. And, uh, you know, two months later, my thesis is basically accepted to Nature as a 14 page uh, paper with only five authors, and I was the first. And um, I suddenly sort of come to my advisor, who basically says, congratulations, your paper was accepted. Won't that make a great chapter for your thesis? And I say, well, don't you mean won't that make a great thesis? And he says, oh, yes, 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 that's exactly what I meant. And uh, I'm like, all right, I turn around the corner, I'm like, yes, 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 I congratulate. So I basically had to do my minor, I had to find a committee for my thesis, I had to do a proposal, I had to do my qualifiers, et cetera, but I had two months to graduate. So then I graduated and my next paper the following year was about uh, the genome duplication of yeast. So again, compared to genomics, but now more about sort of what's different than what's conserved. So basically the, the, the PhD thesis itself was about sort of how to read information through the lens of evolution. So basically how to use evolutionary signatures to understand the content of DNA and the content of genomes. And basically my second uh, paper was about uh, the, the incredible event of a whole genome duplication in yeast that basically gave rise to modern, you know, baker's yeast, the, the, the most abundant species of yeast in uh, the fields of Tuscany and also, uh, you know, in the making of beer and, you know, wine and bread is in fact the descendant of a whole genome duplication. 
And basically, for the first time, we could stare across this incredible boundary of a pre-duplication relative and a post-duplication relative that were basically very close and just flanking that incredible event. So suddenly, you know, I could uh, be the first to sort of look at how genomes evolve both during a genome duplication and after genome duplication. But anyway, uh, one year later, in January 20, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, 2004, I emailed back to Pavel, having not responded for a year, saying, dear Pavel, thank you so much for your email. I would love to come visit. So, <laughs> so, so suddenly I was ready to apply for faculty jobs uh, now that my second nature paper was accepted. And then I went on the job circuit and I got you know, wonderful offers from wonderful places, including Berkeley and UCSD and MIT. And I basically decided to stay at MIT as a professor. So the challenge, however, is that I did my undergrad, my master's, my PhD, and my postdoc all at MIT. And suddenly I was among the faculty. So I feel that I didn't get the chance to kind of quote, quote unquote grow up and uh, you know sort of think of myself as a professor. I still think of myself as sort of the merry-go-lucky undergrad who's just so lucky to be where I am and to constantly learn about so many different things surrounded by incredibly smart colleagues and friends. And uh, that's, that's basically what has defined both my career and my attitude uh, towards life. Like basically the, you know, just very lucky kid who's, who is basically at the, at the right place at the right time, had an amazing uh, project and amazing opportunities. And I, I try to sort of give the same thing to my students now, just basically create an awesome environment for research where the sky and their imagination is the limit. And I provide everything they need to do also research, go out of my way, write a bunch of grants, gather these amazing data sets, and just give them the opportunity to just explore and go wild. The same opportunity that I was given as a student with just an incredibly wealthy data set uh, where, you know, whatever I could mine from that data was, uh, you know, news to the world. And uh, I feel that our field has not only not shrunk, but it has exploded. And there's just so, so many opportunities now for young, smart students in computer science to make a true impact in the biological uh, disciplines. And to truly learn about life, learn about the, the basic foundations of what makes us human, what makes our brain function, what makes our heart and lungs and you know uh, immune system uh, work, and also uh, fail in disease. So how you know how do we understand the system deviations from normal behavior or from typical behavior? that give us both the incredible diversity and you know uh, awesomeness of the human body and the human brain in how it varies between individuals but also gives us the tragic uh, onset of disease whether it's age related disorders or whether it's genetic disorders that manifest very early in life how do we now understand that system and how do we use the principles of engineering to address the deviations and you know when necessary intervene and reverse uh, the the circuits that lead to human disease so how do we systematically understand the information in the human genome and how do we intervene and reverse these circuits that go wrong quote unquote when disease manifests this is fascinating i mean fascinating journey a uh, fascinating experience to hear about and um, I think just from the intro itself, I have so many questions. <laughs> um, so maybe first we can define the information itself because this is um, a concept which is now kind of uh, dominating in biology that life is information. Um, I remember reading um, Paul Nurse's book, What is Life? where he talks about one of the principal, one of the crucial elements of life is uh, information. So uh, what is this information that we are talking about? And is it really, uh, I think, the is it really the best way to look at it? So <clears throat> it's very hard to decouple the physical instantiation of life 
from the informational content of life. So it's, it's very tempting as a computer scientist to basically say, oh, I've sequenced the genome of that species. I'm done. I know how to recreate it. But life never recreates itself purely from the genome. Yes, the genome is fundamental and foundational, and it's the blueprint for making more of yourself. But you don't start from scratch nowadays. We are 3 billion years in, and um, every new life begins with a previous life. So the mother cell, the, you know, the egg, has so, so much more information than what's encoded in the DNA itself. And if you look at mammals, it's not just an egg in isolation. It's an egg fed and nourished and constantly interacting with the immune system, with the blood supply, with the nutritional system of the mother that is basically channeling it as it grows. So when we start thinking about uh, <clears throat> life as information, um, you also have to distinguish also what non-life what information non-life also contains. So, you know, you can think about maybe the number of equations that would be needed to describe a black hole or to, to describe a solar system or to describe a geologically active, but, you know, life-wise dead planet like Mars, for example. And, you know, how many equations would you need to describe all of Mars. And, you know, it's easy to sort of simplify and say, oh, yeah, there's just a few equations of gravity, it's better. But then you have all of the tectonic movements, all of the geological activity, all of the, you know, solar winds and all of the, you know, chaotic weather patterns. And at some point, you realize that maybe the distinction is blurry between sort of inert and alive uh, objects in our galaxy and in our, and in our, in our solar system and in the cosmos. Um, but there's something fundamentally very different about life the way that we know it on planet Earth. Basically this DNA-based life form, the, the fact that at the core, life is digital. Basically, if you look at DNA, it is a digital medium that encodes digital information in, in you know, not, not two bits of information, but, you know, four letters, uh, not, not just, you know, one bit of information, but two bits of information with four letters at every position. So it's not zeros and ones, it's ACGT, but it is digital. And I think that type of information is fundamentally different from say the equations that you need to describe, I don't know, differential equation systems or fluxes and you know, weather patterns, et cetera, and it's sort of gravitational pools and you know, gravitational waves, et cetera. So the, the combinatoric nature of digital information, the fact that you know, with 3 billion letters, you have two to the, you know, or at least four to the 3 billion um, you know, possibilities. And that I think is, you know, perhaps more information rich than almost anything else in the universe. Like basically, if you look at how much information is encoded in these two meters worth of DNA inside each one of your cells, it is truly mind boggling to sort of, you know, fathom that you truly have enough bits of information there to describe you know, galaxies and, you know, cos uh, entire cosmos, basically, on every, in every one person on the planet. Now, there's the transformation of this information through the birth of every, every new human being and, you know, the conception, every new zygote that start dividing and now has a body plan. And, and there's such a beauty in this automaton that is life, in this sort of self-contained cellular machine, which has so many properties that engineering systems would only dream about. The ability to self-replicate, the ability to 
metabolize, to basically take, in for, to take materials from the environment and just make them its own. I mean, think of R2D2, basically just like picking up a bunch of screws and picking up some scrape metals and just reproducing its own organs. I mean, this is an incredible feat of engineering. The, the fact that we can metabolize, we can sort of take other life forms like, you know, a piece of celery and carrots and, you know, fish and, you know, all kinds of beans and, you know, meat and just, you know, digest them down and make them our own. <laughs> like, you know, just like if we could make robots that do that, we would be, you know, thinking of ourselves as, as gods, basically, to, to sort of be able to create that. So that there's that aspect of metabolism. There's the aspect of reproduction of every cell being able to divide. Like if you look at monozygotic twins, they're a single cell that basically splits. And from that one cell, you, you basically get two identical human beings. So, the, you know, one cell would have made a human, two cells make two humans. And, you know, there are experiments where you basically can take the early cells of an embryo of, of two mice, for example, and then blend them and somehow they will reorganize and form a single mouse. So it's truly magnificent that you basically have this ability to number one, divide, and all of the information is encoded in every one of the two parts that have now divided from the two daughter cells. But also the developmental body plan that is encoded in just a small number of genes. The fact that I know where the anterior and the posterior is, the dorsal and the ventral. I know where the limbs you know, begin and end. I have a fully formed irrigation system that channels blood through all of my cells to nourish them, a fully you know, integrated immune system and circulatory system and you know, sort of musculature and the bone structure, et cetera. Like if you basically just think that every one of those cells in your body are in fact exactly the same information, the same exact 3.2 billion letters are basically reused by the same automaton to now make all of these self-connected, intricately intertwined systems of communication within our bodies, that's unfathomable. And again, I can't even begin to describe the next level of complexity, which is probably the most complex system in the universe, uh, you know, uh, beyond even the human genome, which is the human brain. So the fact that that same set of genes not only encodes a fully functional body plan, but it encodes an incredible, incredibly malleable cognitive system that is able to process information at a speed so much faster than the time scale of transcription and translation and all of the basic cellular processes that work inside our bodies. So basically, you can think of the vehicle as the body, and then this incredible sort of cognitive system encoded within our brains that somehow has managed to have millisecond reactions to a much faster moving world around us, despite the fact that transcription takes minutes and sometimes hours for you know, some of our genes. So we basically have many different timescales of layers of processing through which the single unit of information has now encoded layers upon layers of interconnected systems one of which is sufficiently complex to not only comprehend the cosmos, but go and explore it and build machines that go to Mars and, you know, travel outside our solar system and, you know, image our Milky Way and detect gravitational waves and sort of learn about ultrasound and things that our bodies never evolved to to, to, to capture like infrared and ultraviolet and sort of expanding our senses, expanding our, our ability to sort of comprehend time and space from the ultra small down to the quarks to the ultra big to the edge of our universe from the beginning of time with the big bang and you know beyond to the end of time of sort of how our you know galaxy falls apart and how our sun you know, implodes and how all of, you know, 
you know, the universe ends. I mean, to me, the fact that within a lifetime, you can learn about the whole beginning and ending of the universe from the micro small to the ultra big, et cetera, thanks to this cognitive system that you have between your ears is magical. It's, it's sort of, it puts humans and planet earth in such a special place in the universe because the universe is kind of boring and life on earth makes it exciting. And this concentration of information encoded within one human cell by itself brings order and meaning and you know beauty to the universe like who's there to appreciate it if it wasn't for life like you know we would have these most beautiful sunsets on earth and no one would be around to sort of appreciate them and appreciate the beauty of our galaxy and and and, and the cosmos if it wasn't for life and you know yes animals can appreciate them and 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 that's life and that's a magical thing but humans can appreciate them at such a deeper level. So, and again, I've only talked about the information in one human genome, and now you can think of the information in all of life on Earth, like from the viruses that constantly attack us to the bacteria that have taught us how to defend us, you know, against them, and how to edit genomes, you know, through CRISPR, uh, and to the you know wealth of plant life and you know mushrooms and all of these you know sort of kingdoms that are surrounding us uh, to sort of marine life and you know the quote unquote boring tetrapods that exited and um you know this incredible wealth of inventions so if you look at if you look at the history of evolution there are gazillions of life forms and molecular machines that are constantly invented through the bacterium, bacterial kingdom and that are sort of reused and you know, dispersed through the evolution of life that are teaching us about chemical reactions that we never imagined possible, about enzymatic sort of metabolic changes, about drugs about you know uh defense mechanisms that are just so intricate and and life is constantly evolving all of these things uh you know surrounding us uh, a tiny little snippet of which are the twenty thousand genes at least protein coding genes of the human genome and maybe another twenty thousand non-coding genes which you know and then sort of 2.3 billion uh, sorry million uh regulatory elements that sort of make up human circuitry but that's such a small tiny part of the diversity of, you know, biological inventions. So when you think about sort of information in DNA, you can't help but marvel at how little we have explored and how that little thing inside, you know, each one of our cells listening to this podcast is so incredibly rich, but also how much of a tiny little part it makes of the amazing biodiversity of planet Earth. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. So, I mean, of course, when we um, look at from physics physicists' point of view, um, there is this um, you know again increase in complexity as you already explained, uh, which and of course the life form is the most complex thing in the universe. Um, so when we are uh, talking about uh, this complexity, we can also talk about uh, the second law of thermodynamics, which basically um, explains the increase in entropy. That means um, anything or with the time disorder increases. But what happens, I mean, this is also clear that life is basically uh, sort of against that law because it's it, it explains the order coming from disorder. But what happens in the case of genome or in the case of uh, information that once we go into more complexity, more complex form of life, what happens to the organization? What, what happens to the, uh, the, the kind of disorder? Is it more disordered or it's more ordered in a way? So you can basically look at life 
in the form of gradients. I basically, you know, sort of, uh, I think <laughs> building a proton gradient in a membrane, for example, if you take the mitochondrial membrane and sort of the buildup of energy through the separation of protons, I mean, that's, you know, fundamentally the, the, the basic building block of, you know, all of life, of basically fighting against entropy, of sort of increasing separation. Things don't just diffuse, but the membrane and the ability to sort of channel things. If you think about Maxwell's demon of sort of pushing molecules, you know, in one side of a membrane, that's basically a, a fundamental building block of all of life. And one word to summarize it would be compartmentalization. The fact that you build compartments, that the cell itself is separating its self, the notion of a self from the non-self, from the outside. The fact that there's a fundamental difference upon which, for example, metabolism is based. So metabolism is taking the non-self and using it to make more of the self. And you basically have this ability to create this concentration of nutrients to increase the concentration of nutrients to sort of constantly push things in rather than sort of let them diffuse out and this is unmistakable for life for basically the the, the sort of basic building block of life the the fact that you're able to sort of fight back against entropy to sort of increase order rather than disorder now, if you think about sort of prokaryotes versus eukaryotes, even, even at, the, at the level of a single cell, a eukaryotic cell is much more compartmentalized. You basically have these energy producing molecules or sort of compartments, not molecules, uh, that are your mitochondria. So basically they, um, you know, they're an ancient organism that has still you know, remnants of its own DNA. So there are 13 genes that have still been maintained uh, from that ancient engulfment event where we basically ate up a mitochondrion. We have a nucleus, which basically compartmentalizes the DNA storage of information from the cytoplasm and all of the sort of cellular activities. Even within the nucleus, you have dozens of compartments. You have the nucleus, for example. You have you know, all of these different organelles, even within the nucleus. And of course, in the cytoplasm, you have chloroplasts, for example, for you know, plants. You have you know, the endoplasmic reticulum. You have you know, the cytoskeleton. You have all of these different cellular compartments that um, sort of have increased this compartmentalization. So I would say that you know, there's, a, of course, a lot more complexity, but there's a lot more ordering to make that complexity function. And if you look at chromatin organization, if you look at sort of the topologically associated domains of our chromosomes, there's just so much modularity and hierarchical organization that allows you to now organize these increasingly complex amounts of information into sort of manageable parts where you can sort of open up the necessary compartments for every cell type. I mean, I was describing earlier how each one of our cells can, you know, has exactly the same DNA to a large approximation and yet looks completely different from each other. How is that possible? That's possible through this compartmentalization. It's possible through the modularity. It's possible through the fact that even though all of these cells have exactly the same DNA, or at least you know, a subset of the 3.2 billion bases that every cell starts out with, <clears throat> there's a different subset of that that is being used in any one of these cell types. And the morphology of the cell types is dramatically different. If you look at the shape of neurons, you basically have you know, every one of our cells is like a thousandth of the width of a hair. You know, these are tiny, tiny, tiny little cells. And yet, axons, for example, from our neurons can stretch all the way from our brains to our toes with a single neuronal connection. You basically have this, you know, incredibly elongated cell alongside your microglia, for example, that are, you know, functioning as immune cells of the brain, as sort of, you know, cleaning up everything inside the brain, as your retina cells or the lens of your uh, you know, eyes, 
or the you know follicles of your hair and you know you have these incredibly diverse like your your muscles basically the ability to sort of be able to move your body comes from these multinucleated elongated cells that are able to sort of use these stress uh you know attachments to the to the bones and to your cartilage and i mean it's just incredible the specialization that you have to make the human body function so as you start thinking about sort of you know information and the fight against entropy i would argue that the more complex you are the more entropy you kind of have to fight against and the more compartmentalization you end up with and the more organization you end up with i mean it's rule number one of any kind of systems engineering course the fact that in order to achieve complexity you have to have modularity you know the the, the concept of abstraction layers is probably the most foundational concept of computer science the fact that you can abstract away the bottom layer and only worry about your layer and then provide an interface to the layer above, et cetera. So I think we see a lot of that in, you know, biology in the sort of the organization of those cells. Basically, they're all based on quantum physics at the, at the limit. And then, you know, you basically have abstraction layers upon abstraction layers of obscuring that complexity to build upon manageable units and layers of information. So does that mean, um, uh, for example, in the unicellular organisms, it will be easier to read the information than uh, like reading that information in the eukaryotes or in the in more complex organisms? I think the gene regulatory circuitry of bacteria is a lot simpler than the gene regulatory circuitry of, say, human. So you basically have a much smaller number of regulators a much smaller intergenic space. So much more compactness there, a smaller set of regulatory programs. You have operads with, you know, sort of many um, genes encoded in a polycystronic way from the same transcript. You basically have, you know, a, just a small number of modules, if you wish, whereas eukaryotic genes, for example, have many, many, many more regulatory elements. They can be millions of nucleotides away looping together. They, that allows them to have different sets of regulatory elements for every cell type where that gene will be utilized. You have exons and introns and splicing, which allows you to sort of break the gene into smaller modules of domains that can be mixed and matched together to create enormously higher protein complexity from the same number of genes. So basically you can, you can have 20,000 genes, but the number of proteins in that is in the hundreds of thousands of proteins that you can make from these small number of genes by mixing and matching these domains through different gene regulatory elements that act pre-transcriptionally and post-transcriptionally through the splicing level to basically create units of function that are you know, much more diverse. So absolutely, you basically have this exponential increase in the complexity through these layers of regulation that have evolved compared to the much simpler set of regulatory principles of bacteria. I mean, again, the principles are fundamentally the same, but you just have layers upon layers upon layers of additional added complexity to deal with the huge information expansion yeah, and so basically, uh, you have already kind of described the reading information means like the, the, the when the information is stored in DNA, it, it simply gets read in 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 the form of RNA and then gets translated into into the proteins. So the so the interesting thing here is the um, in the year 2000, 2001, when the, the first human genome um, was published, and in 2004, basically, you started your tenure. Uh, so fresh information. And, at, and I think that's the point where uh, also the scientists were shocked because they were thinking that there'll be more number of genes in, in humans, for example, compared to the other species. But that wasn't the case, right? Um, do, you, do you remember some stories around, around that time about, about the human no. genome? I was there in Washington, D.C. 
with uh, Francis Collins and wow. uh, Eric Lander and, you know, uh, all of the celebrations that happened, you know, for the completion of the human genome. And um, I have a figure that I made that's in the human genome paper. So if you look, if you search for Hox genes, uh, you know, I actually made, the, you know, one of the figures in, in this massive paper, basically showing how repeat elements are actually depleted in the developmental Hox clusters. Um, so, you know, I, um, I lived through that time of basically watching the first assembly of the public human genome in uh, Serafim Batsoglu's computer and um, uh, you know, being enthralled not by the assembly program, but the, but, but the fact that Serafim had a text file where he had pages upon pages upon pages of ACGT. And I'm like, that is my life's mission, like understanding that code. And I was very fortunate to, again, be at the right place at the right time. Basically, the tools that I developed during my PhD for understanding the content of genomes through their evolutionary signatures have actually become the foundation upon which the current protein coding gene set of the human genome is built. So when we look at the set of protein coding genes in the human genome, my work and my lab have been you know, a key part for that. So we've been part of the GenCode project, the you know, sort of gene set of the human genome basically developing methods like philo csf or codon substitution frequency and phylogenetics that that basically tells us whether a particular segment of the dna is selected evolutionarily for a protein coding function and that is at the foundation of what is the gene set of humanity so where are all the genes the reason why we know that there aren't hundreds of thousands of genes is because of programs that, you know, Chris Burge initially through Gen, uh, GenScan, and then, you know, my group through Philo CSF and, you know, many other groups have basically made to look for the signatures initially in a single genome based on the spicing motifs and the sort of codon frequencies and triplet, uh, you know, nucleotide um, frequencies of coding versus non coding regions. And then ultimately through the comparative genomics of initially four species of mammals, then 29 species of mammals, now 200 species of mammals, that basically allow us to look for how different segments evolve in order to then figure out which ones are protein coding and which, are, which ones are non-coding. So it's very humbling to be part of this mission for understanding the basic building blocks of life. Uh, and, you know, human life in particular. So, uh, you know, Mike Lynn initially, and then Erwin Youngrice in, in my lab have basically sort of carried out this operation for, you know, more than 20 years, uh, sort of, you know, first building the basic signatures and then using them to understand, uh, understand the genome. So, uh, and that's one, one small part of the genome. That's 1.5% of the human genome. That's it. The protein coding parts, 1.5 percent <laughs> you know then there's the like 98.5 percent to understand that's much harder so basically what my group has also done is initially use comparative genomics to discover the dictionary of all regulatory motifs based on their genome-wide conservation patterns based on the ability to sort of recognize that the same pattern of tca spaced by 10 nucleotides from gca is in fact repeatedly conserved in thousands of places in the genome. So that allowed us to now build a basic dictionary of regulatory elements in the human genome. We then develop methods that read the epigenome, that read the, ve the, the very basic, the same exact basic foundational tools that the cell uses to remember which regions are important for its function to remember that it's a neuron and not a liver cell and not a heart you know smooth muscle or uh, other other kind of cell that or, or a vessel and so on and so forth basically all of these um cell types remember what cell type they are through 
specific modifications on the packaging of the DNA. So the DNA is wrapped around these histone proteins that make up nucleosomes, and every 200 nucleotide chunk has a set of modifications that encode what is in that package so that when you're searching for information in the human genome, you don't have to read through all 3.2 billion letters, but you can sort of say, okay, well, in this cell type, these are the active regulatory regions. So when I need to turn on genes, I'm going to only search through the subset of the genome that's you know active in that one cell type. So we basically develop methods to not only use comparative genomics and all of the sequence pattern discovery, but to also use epigenomics and to read that information to understand where are the building blocks of gene regulation, where are the control elements of human cells. And we've now done this across hundreds of cell types. We had a paper in Nature on the 20th anniversary, actually, of the human genome that presented EpiMap, the most complete yet annotation of the human epigenome that basically allowed us to you know, define the activity patterns of 2.3 million regulatory elements across 830 cell types and tissues in the human body and how they turn on and off, how they're connected to nearby genes, how they're connected to their upstream regulators, effectively understanding that circuitry which now allows us to go and understand not just the gene content, but also the non-coding content, and eventually understand how disease manifests through genetic variants that predispose us to different diseases through infinitesimally small effects to basically then understand how these effects are manifesting through these circuits that we have uncovered. So being able to understand these circuits allows us to now take non-coding variants across thousands of genetically associated regions with human disease and then understand who are the upstream regulators that bind these non-coding variants, these letter differences from one human to another human that might predispose us you know, ever so slightly for cancer or Alzheimer's or obesity, and then go and understand who are the upstream regulators? What are the downstream target genes? What are the motifs that are disrupted? What cell types do they act in? What biological pathways are they a part of? So that we can then have a rational approach to designing new therapeutics to sort of understand how we can use these to transform medicine, to transform the way that we go about reversing that circuitry in order to alleviate the burden of disease for every person in the planet, regardless of whether they carry those variants to basically understand through the people who carry the variants, the basic circuitry. But once we understand the circuitry, build drugs for everyone that utilize these circuits and manipulate these circuits, regardless of the genetic diversity of each person. Fascinating work. Um, what so, uh, so one quick question that I had was, so what is the meaning when we say that we are 98% uh, similar to chimpanzees or bonobos, for example? There's very, very few things that have changed in the 5 million years that separate us from chimps. So basically humans and chimps diverge from a common ancestor you know, the chimp lineage went one way and made them more chimp-like and the human lineage went another way and made them more human-like. There's dramatic differences if you look at the physiology of humans. You know, we are the naked ape. We don't have a lot of hair. We also have this giant expansion of the neocortex. Basically, you know, the, the, the chimp neocortex ends here. <laughs> like this whole part is humans. So it, it, it's quite remarkable that, you know, we have so much more cognitive capabilities and there's specializations in the types of neurons, there's specializations in the circuits that are formed, there's specializations in the early life learning, the, the fact that our brain continues to be extremely malleable through our youth all the way to 18 or so. Our brain is just extremely, extremely malleable. That, that's a period of evolution, that, of, of development that you don't see in the other primates. 
you basically that you know that's something unique to humans so if you look at biology we are amazingly different especially when it comes to cognition but if you look at how many differences does it take genomically to make that very very few all you need is you know for one gene which is say the regulator of the timing for how long will the cells keep dividing in your brain all you need is for that one regulator to be slightly more expressed or for you know these regulatory elements to be you know slightly more numerous and suddenly you go from sort of having very few neurons to having a huge number of neurons. So if you, if you look at the number of DNA differences, you might just need one to basically have an enormously larger brain. So, you know, we shouldn't sort of count the differences in just simply nucleotides, right? Because basically if you go in as an engineer and you try to sort of, you know, change an engineering design, so from this automaton, which is programmed, suppose that you've written the code, like, you know, you have for your little like robot, like go right, you know, go straight, turn right, go straight, you know, put the pen down, you know, then start drawing a circle, etc. To make a bigger circle, you just need to change one letter that basically says, you know, instead of going three centimeters, you go 30 centimeters, right? It just takes one letter. Once you have the whole robot built, all you need to do is change one letter for the program. But of course, biology doesn't work that way. It doesn't just change one letter. It changes millions of letters. So, you know, if we say, oh, yeah, well, humans are 99.9% .9 identical to each other. You and I are 99.9% .9 identical. I mean, we are basically identical. But if you look at the 3 billion letters of the human DNA, there's still millions of differences. We have three million differences between any one of us, you know, any two, any two of us. So basically any one person carries six million common variants that are different and, you know, thousands of rare variants that are different from, you know, other humans. So with chimp, you know, it's a lot more, but not that much. And yet, you know, even just a small number would have been sufficient. And these large numbers are basically giving us all of the other functions that are needed to, for example, support our much larger brain. So, you know, our brain is only three pounds and it consumes about 20% of our energy, 15 to 20% of our energy goes to just three pounds of goo in between our ears under our skull. So, you need massive metabolic changes to make that possible. You need massive changes in the irrigation of, you know, this frontal cortex of, you know, all of these neocortical regions in the circuitry and the connectivity between all of these ancient brain regions and these new regions. The ability of our cortex to now control so much more of our bodily functions, of our you know, uh, reasoning and thinking and memory and spatial organization of sort of how we remember events and places, etc. I mean, all of these things are, of course, highly interconnected with each other. It's not just enough to just have more neurons. You need all of the circuitry and the wiring and the, you know, sort of energetic needs and the feeding and the clearing out of debris. When you think about Alzheimer's, you know, why do we, why do humans get Alzheimer's and animals don't get Alzheimer's? probably because we use our brain to such greater capabilities. Basically, we push our cognition to such an extreme as a sort of super high performance machine. We're not just like, you know, uh, you know, good old, I don't know, beat up pickup truck, you know, rolling down the highway. No, we're a race car, you know, running at the limits of what the physics will allow it to do. And, you know, there are some compromises that need to be made in order to sort of maintain that machine and some of those compromises have to do with the clearing of debris, with, you know, sort of optimization for how long of a lifespan will I have a functional, a functional brain for, and, you know, all kinds of other things. So you basically have to uh, understand the human chimp divergence in the context of all of the functional specializations, which are enabled through this, you know, 3 billion years of getting good at evolving through the modularity, through the layers of organization, through the hierarchical construct, so that 
when you have mutations in the DNA, you don't end up with an inside out person. No, you end up with slightly bigger brain or slightly longer limbs or slightly, you know, sturdier column, you know, and so, and so forth, like uh, spine and so on and so forth. So basically, these are all changes that are still biologically interpretable in a fully functional organism. I mean, that's what's amazing about biology, the fact that if I took your, your hard drive and I bombarded it with a thousand different bits altered, you know, after the first 10 bits, it would likely just crash and malfunction. Like, I won't boot now because I flipped 10 bits in your computer. In humans, you can flip thousands of bits. You can flip 6 million bits between any one, you know, any two people. And yet, you get a perfectly valid human being, a perfectly functional human being. I mean, you and I have 6 million differences, and yet both of us have, you know, ears and eyes and noses and, you know, neurons and, you know, um, like all of these things that, that are still functioning, despite this incredible diversity. You see what I mean, right? It's not just like I get a longer nose and suddenly the bone is going to be sticking out of the flesh. No, it's still a fully formed nose. And, you know, if it's longer, it comes with all kinds of auxiliary things that sort of make that nose fully functional. Wow. Yeah. Um, so here, let's say if we, if we, if we kind of recollect everything. So with the, with the increase in complexity um, in biology, of course, we see that the genome size increases, but it's not uh, really the, the number of genes that they increase, that they are somewhat similar. It's basically the known coding region, which, uh, which basically means that it doesn't produce any protein, right? That, that is what, uh, which expands, right? That's exactly right. It's not the basic building blocks of proteins. You don't have new proteins. You don't have a new brain protein that will basically suddenly make you smarter. No, you just have the same building blocks rearranged and controlled and expressed slightly differently. And that's sort of the beauty of evolution. The fact that, yes, sometimes there's dramatic events like the whole genome duplication, where, which allows you to have now 10,000 new genes that you can do anything you want with. And you, know, you can specialize these genes, you can create new domains, you can sort of, every now and then you can create new genes out of nowhere. Most of the time you get new genes by duplication, which allows you to sort of start tinkering with something that's already functional. But every now and then you get a frame shift where basically a stretch of nucleotides is translated in a completely different set of, of amino acids because you've now shifted everything by one. So, you know, what read like a set of 20 amino acids is now read as a completely different set of 20 amino acids. So sometimes this will actually be beneficial and those amino acids will still be functional. And we have, you know, dozens of regions in the human genome where one strand is translated into two different uh, sequences. You know, you have an amino acid sequence here and a, you know, off by one, fully functional amino acid sequence there. And yes, there's 3 billion nucleotides of the human genome. And yes, 98.5 of it is non-coding. So you have plenty of real estate, but it's like your neighbor came and built a house in the middle of your house <laughs> instead of just like an, an entire field in Arizona where there's like no houses whatsoever. And yet your neighbor comes and builds a house right on top of yours. So that's basically what happens in the human genome for some of these regions. The fact that, you know, you can still have two fully functional proteins encoded from the same nucleotides. These are completely unrelated from each other. And of course, after a genome duplication event or a gene duplication event, you can now relieve some of that overlapping complexity. And one is now free to specialize with this new set of amino acids that he created. And the other one is free to take on the old function or a new function and so on and so forth. So this is sort of typically the way through which new complexity arises, but over very, very large timescales. In the timescale of the human chimp divergent, you basically have almost no new protein coding genes. What you have is small differences in the circuitry that basically change functions dramatically. Yes, and the this non-coding regions, they are also kind of labeled as junk DNA. Um, and this is where your works um, work also uh, comes in uh, that the whether it is junk or not, right? Well, it's such a terrible word. But first of all, junk DNA doesn't mean garbage DNA. Junk 
has a connotation of, well, you know, there's probably some good stuff there. It's like your junk, you, you know, sometimes you just, you know, you go in the, in the junk in your garage and you find all kinds of useful things. So at least it's not called garbage DNA. <laughs> but even junk DNA has, you know, this weird connotation. Um, it's basically, again, 98.5% of the genome doesn't code for proteins. That doesn't mean it's not functional. It just means that it doesn't make proteins. There's plenty of it that makes non-coding genes that's still transcribed and makes a fully functional RNA that has all kinds of functions as RNA. There's plenty of it that controls these light switches that basically turn the genes on and off. And that sort of make the DNA fold up and recruit the regulators to start transcription and so on and so forth. There's plenty of it that serves functions as spacer because you need lots of room for all of these regulators to bind. There's lots of it that sort of has roles in attaching to the lamina of the nucleus for non-coding regions that are sort of very often euchromatic, sorry, heterochromatic, that basically are sort of stably repressed to be attaching there. And so you, you need enough linker space. You need space for, um, you know, uh, splicing events to happen. And of course, you also have repeat elements. What are these repeat elements? These are basically selfish, self-replicating, transposable elements whose only function is to replicate themselves. So basically, you have, you know, imagine that you can create that, that at some point in evolution arises a genomic element whose protein product excises its own element, its own DNA, and then copies it. That element will now propagate and will make thousands of copies of itself in the genome. So about 50% of the human genome can be traced to these ancestral repeat elements. So there's massive, massive amounts of human DNA that basically is due to these viruses, like these transposable elements, these self-replicators that just make more copies of themselves purely selfishly, they don't care about us, they just care to replicate. And we have developed massive machinery to shut them down, to basically make sure that they don't get, you know, expressed and sort of go replicating because then they'll wreak havoc on our genome. But what's really interesting also is that these same elements that are purely selfish were co-opted by mammalian genomes to basically build a whole new layer of circuitry by exploiting these regulatory regions because a, a, a self-replicating element has amazingly potent uh, promoters and enhancers that basically make it turn on. Why? Because those elements that had slightly more potent ones were selected by self-replication and then random mutations accumulated. The ones that did not replicate as well did not replicate and the ones that replicated slightly better continued spreading. So they had more opportunities to accumulate additional mutations some of which made them better replicators, some of them which made them worse. So over evolutionary time, these transposable elements were basically fodders for the evolution of new regulatory control regions, which are now split and scattered throughout our genome and can be co-opted for building a more complex regulatory machinery, such as what happened in the mammalian radiation when the asteroid in the north of uh, Chichen Itza were basically, you know, sort of wiped out the dinosaurs and created these evolutionary niches in the airs, underwater, and, you know, on land for mammals to radiate and, you know, eventually primates and eventually humans. So all of that was in part mediated by these self-replicating, purely selfish chromosomal elements. Um, yeah, so maybe we can uh, talk a little bit more about uh, this genome-wide uh, association studies that your group is working on. So um, as a system engineer, you can basically think of the best way to understand a machine by poking it, by sort of making minute little changes and then seeing how it functions. And a lot of genetic studies basically used this principle to understand the basic foundational building blocks of biology. They basically went into viruses, 
they went into bacteria, they went into unicellular eukaryotes, they went into model organism animals, like the worm and the fly and the mouse and the zebrafish to basically carry out perturbations and then see what happens. So there's two ways to understand genome function and sort of biological function. One way is to wipe it out, basically take a gene, knock it out, and then see what happens. The other way is to take that same gene and overexpress it and see what happens. So basically both loss of function and gain of function. And the biochemist way has been, let's take this protein out of its system and then see what it does. The geneticist is, let's take that protein inside its system, wipe it out, and then see what happens. So the changes that basically gave us all of the foundational biological knowledge with which we understand life, including you know, viruses, bacteria, eukaryotes, and ultimately you know, animals and humans, happen through these genetic studies of perturbations, basically scientists going in and perturbing individual genes and then seeing what happens. And that's how we learn about a lot of the basic cellular machinery, the basic replication, you know, uh, all of the functions that are shared at the sort of at, at the level of life. We learn from viruses and bacteria at the level of eukaryotic life. We learn from yeast perturbations and then from animal life. We learn from worm and fly and zebrafish and mouse. And, uh, and I should say from mammalian life, mouse. So that changed fundamentally in the last 20 years. So since the sequencing of the human genome, we are finally able to understand biology in the human first, rather than, oh, we figured out something by knocking out a gene in yeast. And then eventually we figured out that the ortholog, that the corresponding gene in human has probably a similar function. But what's really fundamentally different now is that humans have become the organism of discovery. How is that even possible? I mean, of course, you don't go and perturb humans, but you go and sequence humans. And you then figure out these minute differences between all of us. The six million letters that we were talking about of common genetic variation, which is inherited in every new offspring you basically have the ability to study how these tiny little perturbations are in fact allowing you to result in tiny little phenotypic perturbations. So the challenge, of course, is that computationally, this is a much harder problem. If I knock out a gene completely in a mouse, you'll see that this one has no limbs or this one has you know, a smaller brain or a bigger nose or you name it. So you will basically be able to observe a dramatic difference. In humans, you don't have that. What you have instead is millions of tiny little differences, each of which might affect your height by less than one millimeter. How are you gonna study that? The way that you study that is by measuring the height of hundreds of thousands of humans. And then looking at all of the differences in the DNA of those humans, and then noticing that people who have an A instead of a G at that position are on average one millimeter taller. <laughs> it's crazy, right? Like when you go to bed, you are shorter than when you wake up. When you wake up, you are longer again you know, your height changes during the day just because of gravity more than the vast, vast majority of these genetic variants that we know are statistically unequivocally associated with a robust, statistically significant change in height, which is tiny. So that's where computer science comes in. That's where sort of using the latest and greatest in statistics, in machine learning, in algorithms, in, you know, sort of, you know, sequencing and analysis allows you to now study the system through millions of tiny perturbations rather than one giant perturbation. What's the other challenge? The other challenge is that you don't get to study this one mutation 
in isolation. You can only study it in the context of millions of other mutations. So basically every human doesn't carry one mutation. So in a mouse, you basically have an isogenic line. And the only difference between those two mice is that boom, you've knocked out this gene. So number one, it's a big perturbation. Number two, it's the only change. With humans, you now have millions of changes all coming together. And that's where I think the most beautiful part of what we do comes in. The fact that we are able to study the system from a systems perspective. We're able to study these millions of variables through electronic health records, through single cell profiling of individual cells for their transcriptome, the set of RNAs that they expressed, and the epigenome, the set of regulatory regions that they have active for every single cell across thousands of humans. What does that allow us to do? It allows us to now start asking how these minute differences, which are robustly associated with phenotype, how are they acting at the molecular level, at the cellular level, at the organ level, at the epigenomic level, at the circuitry level, at the protein level, at the metabolic level, at the lipid level, et cetera. So basically we're able to trace the path of causality of how genetic variants manifest themselves, where they manifest themselves, and how ultimately they lead to disease. And that to me has made the human into the model organism of the future and of the present. We are now able to learn more about mouse biology by studying the human than we learn about human biology by studying the mouse. It's amazing. The roles have been reversed. And the reason is because of computational advances, because of machine learning advances, because of the ability of genomics to gather massive amounts of data and to integrate it all together to understand disease. So that's what our group does. What we're basically doing is systematically understanding the mechanism through which these millions of genetic variants are leading to Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia, obesity, Down syndrome, so many different disorders where we can now start studying like cardiac differences, so atherosclerosis, heart failure, um, differences in um, exercise response, differences in you know so so many different systems in cancer predisposition, in response to immunotherapy. We're basically studying all of these different systems through the same foundational principles. So in the same way that the genome led to a unification of biology, genome-wide association studies and all of these new systems genetics and system genomics approaches are now allowing us to lead to a unification of disease to basically understand for every disease, what are all of the systems across the whole body that are impacting the disease? If you think about Alzheimer's disease, you're like, oh, great, it's the brain. Yes, but the brain itself is extremely complex. You basically have a dozen different subtypes of microglia, uh, you know, 17 different subtypes of vascular cells, 30 different subtypes of neurons, of excitatory neurons, another 30 subtypes of inhibitory neurons you know, many different types of astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. So all of these different brain cell types are in fact slightly differently impacted by these genetic variants that are associated with Alzheimer's. And now if you look at the biological processes, they're found throughout the body. Metabolic processes, lipid metabolism, cholesterol biosynthesis, lipid transport, you know, just to say, cite a tiny little number. And there's like suddenly correlations that we're finding between obesity and between vascular disease of the brain, so cerebrovascular, and between cardiovascular changes in the heart. So we're basically finding commonalities between all of these different systems that we're studying. Some students in my lab are studying metabolism. Others are stu studying cardiac disorders. Others are studying Alzheimer's disease. Turns out they're finding the same pathways are underlying all of these. So you can't just simply say, oh, I'm an Alzheimer's scientist. No, that's ridiculous. You can't be... Uh, you know, studying a single system at a time, because all of these systems are in fact interconnected deep down. So basically what's really happening in my lab now is that by working on all of these different systems, we're starting to understand the foundational principles of human disease, of how all of these different pathways, all of these different hallmarks of disease are in fact 
interconnected and sort of reused and rewired and recombined in every single disorder. We're basically finding that every, almost every complex trait that we're studying is connected to almost every other complex trait. And in the end, we're able to distill them down to a small set of biological mechanisms that we are hoping to develop drugs for. So one of the new collaborations that we have is designing new molecules using these graph neural networks and these sort of machine learning techniques for studying structures, for predicting which drugs will bind to what target genes. By using all of these networks to predict the new target gene that we should be going after, to predict the cell types where we should be targeting them, and then to collaborate with both computational and experimental scientists to design and synthesize these molecules to effectively enable rational therapeutics that go after all of these pathways and that allow us to now have a toolkit, to have a combinatoric toolkit that allows us to now modulate the specific pathways that are dysregulated in every single person for every single disorder. That's the ultimate vision, to basically understand these commonalities, understand these basic foundational circuitry, and then use it to change medicine, to change human disease forever, to basically allow us to approach it from an engineering first principles perspective. Fascinating. Um, since you're doing so many things, I mean, um, there is no wonder, basically, your kids that they don't want to continue in this field, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Or maybe don't... you will address all the questions by the time they'll reach in the... <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt it. What we're, what we're basically doing is building a set of foundations, but upon these foundations, you can have decades and decades of work to crack open, not just human disease, but also human biology to sort of be able to start, you know, um, addressing so many issues of equity, of, you know, um, health, of enabling human diversity to thrive by addressing disease in a fundamental way so that we don't have to exclude people like Stephen Hawking, for example, because they have ALS, but we can allow them to thrive, to basically use the amazing genetic diversity that has given them unique skills, you know, in music, in literature, in dance, in, you know, uh, rhyming, in, in artistic abilities or in you know physics in chemistry in you know literature and mathematics and computer science and you know biology like you know take the diversity of the human brain <clears throat> take the diversity of of talents and abilities and interests and drives and passions that humanity has and not worry about the disease component because we can address that. We can sort of engineer ways to make all of these diverse humans live a healthy and fulfilled life, but allow their creative juices to change all of human knowledge. Uh, and, and sort of that's, that's what I think makes the human species unique, this accumulation of culture that leads to this exponential growth of ideas, of achievements, by being able to build across each other, by connecting all of humanity in this information superhighway that allows a discovery made in India today to have an impact in you know, Alabama and in you know, Japan and in Kenya and sort of you know, across the world, everyone can access the same set of papers, the same set of preprints, the same set of Wikipedia articles, the same you know, books, um, electronically for the whole world. And, and suddenly knowledge can accelerate so, so rapidly by allowing human diversity to thrive without the burden of disease, of sort of, you know, holding these individuals back because of, you know, either their genetic predispositions or their environmental shortcomings, et cetera. We have a long way to go, but the building blocks are being built now. And, and, and sort of, I really do believe that we are entering a new generation of medicine that basically by understanding these biological principles, by understanding these foundations, by building these sets of hallmarks, 
to understand disease <clears throat> and to understand every system and every organ in the body, we will then enable a, a new phase of humanity where we can sort of thrive uh, in, in collaborative ways. Yeah, I, I think I have two uh, interesting uh, things or two interesting points to make here. So the first thing is that um, also this will allow uh, people to kind of make changes in their lifestyle uh, to prolong their aging simply. Uh, th that's fascinating. The second thing that I see is that uh, you have quite kind of uh, unified the um, understanding of genome itself. Like, you know, there is, I mean, of course, coding, non-coding and whatever, uh, we can divide the regions, etc. But like from your understanding, from your work, I, I get that feeling already that you are looking at the, the whole genome as an information and just looking at the points which are changing in the population, which is, uh, again, amazing. We are building on decades of knowledge. We're contributing our sort of small stepping stones for others to build on. But I think you need all of the above. You basically need genomicists that are taking the global approach. And then you still need the traditional biology, sort of take any one of these biological pathways and just push it to completion. And you need thousands of experiments for any one of these biological pathways to truly understand its marvelous complexity and functions. But, but yes, what we are contributing is a layer of building blocks and the sort of systematic association with disease to sort of predict the biological pathways, the genes, the circuits, the regulators, the target genes, the upstream controls, you know, the downstream targets, and all of that as tools for the next generation of scientists to not have to work it all out painstakingly, you know, experiment after experiment after experiment to basically say, in my PhD, I already know this circuit. I'm going to go in and manipulate all of these different tools because I know where they are. It's not, it's not unexpected nor territory anymore. We basically now have the cartography of the circuits of the human genome, and we can use it for exploration. It's the difference between sort of walking down the savanna in uncharted territory and just using, you know, Google Maps to sort of be able to know exactly where to navigate. And, you know, sure, of course, you know, in the savanna without a map, you can still make plenty of discoveries. But if you have the full cartography, then you can be much more precise about the types of experiments that you're going to carry out and don't get me wrong, these experiments are absolutely needed. And you need both types of scientists to coexist, basically the sort of pathway centered, and then the genomicist, the geneticist, the epigenomicist, the computational science, computational biology, the machine learning, to all coexist in a network, in an ecosystem of mutual respect and collaboration. Yeah, as you said that, um humans we as humans we have this culture of uh, sharing the information and uh, so that the next generation can build on uh, on on something uh, that we have already found yeah. um i think this is where we can talk about synthetic life which is uh, interesting and whether understanding the circuitry of life can help us to also kind of create a synthetic life so Again, we, you know, it's, it's very tempting for us to call ourselves gods by basically saying, oh, I typed in a genome, I put it in a cell, and out came a new species. Yeah, but you didn't start from scratch. You started from a cell, from a mother cell, and so on and so forth. So yes, I do believe in synthetic biology. Yes, I do believe that we can sort of build circuits that didn't exist before and sort of take parts from biology not just from human biology, but from the immense diversity of viral, bacterial, you know, archaeal, uh, eukaryotic, animal, plant, you know, marine, terrestrial, aerial, <laughs> take all of this incredible diversity and mix and match components and circuits to basically build new building blocks, new circuits, new machines that allow us to sort of create a huge, huge new diversity of functions. And then, you know, that can have implications for nourishing the planet, for solving our energy crisis, for, you know, addressing so many different foundational societal, human level, planet level problems. Um, and, and all of that is absolutely within reach 
thanks to this. So basically, you know, our group is focused on understanding the human genome, but you know, these techniques can be used to understand sort of the planetary genome, if you wish, to basically start building new synthetic circuits and co-opting them for, you know, other either sort of uh, applications for, you know, engineering and for science, et cetera. But at some point, you might also think about co-opting them for human health. You know, if you look at CRISPR, it's basically a bacterial defense system against viruses that we have now co-opted to edit human DNA. So who knows how many more of those discoveries remain to be made where we can basically co-opt these biological systems in new synthetic circuits that can now allow us to improve human health, human cognition, human longevity, human resilience, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I am very optimistic about our engineering ability to co-opt all of these incredibly diverse machines, but we should be very humble about it because what we're doing is using the products of evolution to basically transform medicine, to transform, you know, uh, food, energy, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, new biomaterials, new uh, synthetic limbs, new human machine interfaces, all of these things will be possible by exploring, understanding, and reusing the products of nature. The next stage beyond that is to now start designing machines to basically design, perhaps using an expanded set of amino acids, perhaps using an expanded genetic code, perhaps using an expanded set of, you know, uh, protein, lipid, glycan interfaces that has never been invented, you know, in nature yet, but that we as engineers can invent and then push beyond just the reuse and the rewiring and the sort of remixing and matching of these biological components to truly design new components and sort of create new synthetic uh, building blocks. And, you know, this will undoubtedly come as well as we get better about predicting protein structures, predicting chemical structures, et cetera, we can basically start perhaps designing new machines that were previously not yet invented by life. Yeah. Um, and then what do you think about the artificial intelligence? So as, as you uh, were explaining that the, uh, so the, in the genome or in the life, we see layers upon layers uh, acting, right? So is it possible that once or at some point we can understand how these layers are really uh, connected? And um, if we have uh, some sort of machine learning program, which can just take on these layers and kind of start working or uh, start creating those kind of uh, phenotypes that we want to see, or somehow if we can, if we can kind of make it learn from the biological system and uh, to see whether it can act on, on the instructions that, that we are giving. I think that machines and humans will be working side by side and already are. So basically if you look forward, it's crazy to imagine humans doing everything. No, I think that already machine learning and AI are part of our assistance. You know, we basically as humans can design a process where three different steps at different parts of that process are in fact machine intelligence. And that's perfectly fine. And I, I, that's sort of how I see the future. I don't see machines working in isolation saying, oh, we don't need you humans anymore. We're gonna do the whole thing. But I can imagine sort of, you know, engineers working side by side with artificial intelligence systems that can solve sub problems amazingly well, much better than any human designer would be able to make because they're able to sort of explore a much larger design space, sometimes come up with solutions that we humans wouldn't have thought of or that actually are counter to many of the design principles of sort of how human design systems. I mean, if you look at AlphaGo, and if you look at, you know, um, the chess, uh, you basically have machines that are sort of coming up with strategies for the game that make humans go back and say, whoa, this made no sense. No human player would have done this move in Go. In the history of humanity, we haven't ever come up with such an idea. 
But now you can look at what did the machine come up with and then come back and write a new book for how to play Go based on what we saw the machine doing. And we as humans can start reasoning about it and perhaps come up with new principles that will then let machines come up with the next generation of solutions and sort of go back and forth. So I, I expect the same thing will be happening in sort of synthetic biology and in so many different disciplines where by having humans and machines work side by side, you can sort of learn from each other. You can initially teach the machine based on a lot of examples, eventually let the machine figure things out by itself and then continue creating. Look at the creations, learn more engineering principles, perhaps push it down a different path and sort of this coexistence of human intelligence and machine intelligence, I, I think is not just the, the way of the future, but it's probably already the way of the present for so many different disciplines and only more to come forward. Yeah, so what do you, what do you think of the, um, that, that what can be the uh, biggest discovery of 21st century if, you, if you'll predict? I think it's basically bringing all these ideas and directions that I've sort of mentioned as our goals, bringing them to life. Basically, it'll take, you know, many, many people, not just my group, but many, many people to make this happen. But having a set of molecules, having a set of drugs, having a set of manipulations for every single pathway in the human genome to basically be able to rewire any aspect of our biology. On one hand, to combat disease. On the other hand, to extend the lifespan. And thirdly, to sort of perhaps improve the human condition, perhaps improve you know, our well-being, perhaps improve our cognition, perhaps improve our athletic abilities through systems that already exist in nature but have not yet been co-opted by humans and maybe have not been co-opted by the same human all at the same time. There's extraordinary abilities if you look at human diversity and being able to find the right combination of molecules that allow us to manipulate these circuits to perhaps enable just a more complete human life for you know, uh, so, so many people in the planet would be, you know, perhaps the most foundational and, and dramatic uh, change of the human condition that we have seen in the history of humanity. And that's just for human life. Now, the, the sort of whole human machine interfaces and working alongside AI and sort of, you know, intelligent systems. Again, we've seen more advances in AI in the last 15 years than we have in you know, the history of AI and, and of course, obviously the history of humanity. So I think we are so close to that singularity. I think we're so close to this exponential growth in advances that you know, will we'll sort of transform life as we know it. So I think within our lifetimes, we're gonna see a world that our children will, you know, couldn't have even imagined and that, and that we as children couldn't have even imagined. So uh, I'm very optimistic. And uh, you know, I think it's, it's gonna be the right balance of containing our, our worst instincts and um, you know, human flaws and sort of embracing collaboration, coordination and sharing uh, of all of these advances with a much broader uh, set of uh, individuals than have traditionally been uh, receiving those. And I think this comes from making advances that, that just make the pie bigger, that sort of allow you know, well-being and health and a, not just a healthy life, but a fulfilled life for so, so many more of us. Yeah, since uh, we are discussing about beauty of the genomes, uh, what would you uh, tell people you know, to read about, I don't know, genomes, if they want to work on genomes, uh, what kind of message would you like to give? How, like, where, how do you look at this beauty in genomes? I, I think it comes with an appreciation for the beauty of life and for the beauty of the planet and for the beauty of the animal kingdom and for the beauty of the human body and for the beauty of the human mind and the human brain. I think it, it sort of comes with humility to being able to just 
observe, learn, appreciate, understand. And that's on the biological side. And then on the computational side, again, humbly sit down and, you know, uh, take classes in basic foundational statistics, mathematics, computer science, machine learning, artificial intelligence, sort of programming, you know, build yourself a quantitative set of skills along with your biological and medical set of skills. And I think these are the, the, the two basic pillars upon which you can build a career of impact in that, in that field. So, um, and, and, and there's like a huge number of courses that are fully online. Sort of all of my courses are on YouTube. You can watch them freely. You can sort of learn from, you know, Stanford, from MIT, from Harvard, from all of the universities in the world. Uh, you, you have also people who are not professors who are just amazing communicators who have put so much material out there for free. So I would say start with Wikipedia, start with YouTube, and this gives you the sort of entry point. And then you have so many more articles on, you know, BioArchive and MedArchive and Archive for preprints, you know, before they even go through peer review for open source uh, journals that are increasingly the norm for, uh, you know, PubMed and um, the, you know, sort of forcing by NIH for all federally funded research to have open source preprints uh, that are uh, sort of prior to the editors uh, sort of having their input. So I think there's just incredible av availability of breadth, but also incredible availability of depth for any one of these areas. And frankly, I, you know, I wish I had a hundred hours every day because there's just so, so much to learn every single day that um, basically the, the most difficult part is finding the time to, to learn about all of these things that, that are now possible. Yeah, uh, fascinating. So uh, with that, thank you so much for the conversation. Thank you for accepting the invitation. Uh, this was really good uh, for me. I mean, I, I I think I already told you that uh, I saw you here in Brno, and after that, like once I uh, listened to your presentation, I was following your lectures, your conversations on on YouTube, and uh, you've been an ins inspiration. And I think you will inspire more. Uh, thank you so much, Jitendra. Thank you for doing this. Thanks for inviting me, and thank you for your service. Thanks for bringing all these awesome people to your podcast. I hope that this is going to continue to grow and uh, that that sort of many people will be inspired and, uh, you know, going to this field, we can't hire fast enough. We basically have a, a dire need for more computational biologists, for more computer scientists, for more biologists. So it's, it's, a, it's a discipline that's booming, expanding. And for all of you young listeners out there, uh, please uh, join our field, uh, learn the foundations and, and come join us for this mission to transform uh, human life, human health, and uh, hopefully all of biology. Every, everything is for science, so thank you. Thank you, Jitender, bye. Bye.